Hey everyone, as y'all are logging on, we're, we're going to take a few minutes or a couple of minutes anyway to, to let everyone get on and get, get everything settled into place. We do have quite a few that's registered for the event tonight. So we want to make sure that everybody has the, the time that they need to, to get uh, situated so they can, they can uh, fully understand and hear what we're saying, what we're doing. And we'll go into a couple of opening remarks, but uh, we'll give a couple of minutes to let everyone get in and get settled. As you are logging on, what we'll do tonight to start the, the webinar, just like we do every month, is once we get to the point where we see that clicker start to slow down on, on people jumping on board with us, um, we'll we'll ask a few questions and make sure that uh, everybody understands the fee the features that are available there on the, the chat and the Q&A and, and how we we uh, communicate back and forth with you. But um, what we want to do is make sure that we we cover the topic thoroughly then according to, to what we have on slides. And then what we'll do is we'll shift gears and we'll move over to a Q&A. And then uh, the way that we we uh, function at that point is you just type in your, your question and to the chat and we'll we'll answer those questions appropriately. So while we're doing that, though, while everyone's still jumping on is, is uh, we'll go ahead and do some introductions tonight. What we've got there, you can see if, if you all can see the screens on the side there is uh, Marshall Locker is our trap support manager. Uh, Marshall's going to be with us uh, tonight to help navigate through those questions as he does most every Thursday night that we have these these events. Uh, next on the list is Margaret Porter. Margaret Porter is the chief among our outstanding customer service uh, that we have there. To, that's the first point of contact that you all have whenever you call into Pig Brig. Uh, the two Vickies that we have there is actually is Amanda Rawlison. She is our operations manager. And then there with her as well under the other Vicky is uh, Brooke Lloyd, our, our marketing guru and, and social media expert. So try to make sure that we have quite a few folks that join you so you can get some names and faces together with Pig Brig and who we are and, and not just a, a website and, and somebody that you see on a biography page or something. So uh, they'll help us navigate through the questions as you as you have them tonight. And, uh, and we'll make sure that we do not log off until we have all of your questions answered. And, uh, and then obviously, as you're going through, if there's any topics that you think of that we need to cover in future webinars and things of that nature, we'll definitely let us know at that info at pigbrig.com or punch that into that chat this afternoon as well that we may need to cover this moving forward. Uh, so we do have some, some, some things that will be coming out pretty soon on another webinar opportunity that's just going to be absolutely phenomenal. That's going to come from ad, that that's uh, actually across the pond from us. So it's going to be somebody that's pretty special, pretty important to the worldwide pig scene. So whenever that information is finalized, make sure that you you keep in touch with us and check your your emails and your Facebook pages to 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 see whenever that's launched. But that's going to be pretty important, uh, pretty unique situation. So. We are starting to see that number start to, to slow down as far as those those folks that are joining us tonight. And uh, what we want to do, we'll start off the same as what we have in the past is is um, we'll have you go up to the, where you see the chat feature, the Q&A. In that Q&A, we want to make sure that all of you know how to, to use that feature accordingly, since that is the way that we communicate. But tonight, what I want you to do to answer the question so we get you that chance to use that Q&A the question tonight I want you to answer is let us know either yes or no. Do you eat wild pig? Do you eat feral hog? So is that something that you catch and you end up putting it on your on your table through your barbecue pit or something like that? So tell us yes or no. Do you eat feral hog? So uh, as we do that tonight, obviously, the reason I asked that question is tonight and I see a lot of a lot of responses coming in. And that's what we like to see. Uh, that y'all are using those features accordingly and, and know what we need to do to communicate. So what we'll see coming up on the on the screen now is the upcoming webinars. Uh, if you'll notice there that too, Brooke has updated that, that webinar sheet and what we'll be doing in the 2023, early 2024 uh, event list is there on the screen. The other things to keep in mind is always make sure that you remember we are on the fourth Thursday of each month. Uh, for me in Texas, it's central time. So uh, seven o'clock central. If you're over there where Marshall is, what well, are you already bedtime? Ain't you, Marshall? That's eight o'clock, right? Oh, so, yeah. but if you're out there where Brooke is, Brooke's a little further behind us at, at five in, in that, that west side of the, the, the state. So anyway, that's what's coming up. 
7 o'clock Central, moving forward. The only two exceptions to that are November and December, obviously, because of Thanksgiving and Christmas. But we'll have those updated times as we get a little bit closer to that. But what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, we're going to talk about the diseases and those, those considerations and concerns around feral hogs and uh, and what we need to think about. So uh, with that, moving on forward, uh, my name again, too, is Aaron Sumrall. I don't know if I even introduced myself or not, but, uh, but we'll be covering some of the things tonight. First things first is disease considerations on pigs. The thing that we get asked a lot of times about pigs is, man, I don't want to mess with those things because it's, it's just the unbelievable concerns out there surrounding diseases. And the main thing we need to take away with that is don't let that disease concern prevent you from removing those feral hogs. Uh, those diseases are not just like um, standing around the corner and wait for you to walk around so they can mug you type thing. Uh, it's something that you need to respect the response or the possibility, but move forward. We don't need to worry about whether or not uh, that disease is going to be present in that particular pig. But what we need to think about is some of the things that, that would keep us safe uh, in the event that that pig may have a, a disease and, uh, and, but definitely don't let that stop your management efforts moving forward. Tonight, some of the things we need to think about big picture, big picture is there is, uh, we want to think that one, it's either going to be bacterial or viral. When we think about diseases and, and that are bacterial in nature, that means that they're just more responsive to pharmaceutical treatment. They are spread, spread through bacteria, uh, whereas with viral, a virus situation, it's very limited uh, as far as response. And, and sometimes there's some vaccines out there that can help with viral, the, the basically the preventative side of a viral possibility or a viral uh, infection. But again, that has to be a vaccine prior to uh, the, the possible infection occurring and so forth. So that's the difference between the two. Bacterial, yeah, if it does turn up in a blood test that you have a bacterial situation, they do respond to pharmaceutical treatment. Whereas viral, you better make sure your vaccines are in place ahead of time uh, to minimize the effect or to take away the possibility of infection. Where on the other side is something that we need to worry about on our human side is the word zoonotic. And basically, basically the, the, the fancy word there, zoonotic, just means that diseases that can be transmitted to humans. So of the diseases out there, yeah, some of them are, are specific to pigs, but some of them out there, obviously, that pigs can carry, we have to be carrying them uh, ourselves. So why do we worry about concerns ourselves? I mean, what, what's the purpose of, of letting uh, disease possibilities run through our mind with regard to pig management? And, and obviously, we need to think about those zoonotic diseases first and foremost. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those in detail in a couple of slides. But tonight, what we want to make sure in this first slide is that we need to think about how we minimize that possibility of transmission um, of that disease from pig to human. Um, the next thing out there is what are those pigs leaving in the wildlife or leaving or leaving for the wildlife or in the environment? A lot of places that we look at where pigs are expanding quickly are in places that have low water availability, more of those arid environments and things like that, where everything on the landscape is using the same water source. And what are those, what could those pigs be shedding into that water source? So whenever they get down there and they find a cool spot to, to, to wallow in, that doesn't mean they're leaving the pool to go to the bathroom, folks. It just, what's, what other species? are going to have to be using that same water source, what could pigs be leaving behind? So there's going to be some environmental concern, concerns that are there uh, with regard to wildlife or anything that's out there. Um, other thing out there, obviously, agriculture quarantines uh, and, and potential export stoppages. And one of those things to think about for those of y'all that have cattle and you're familiar with cattle operations, when you think about agriculture quarantines, what I remember most clearly is back in the day, whenever they would have the, the, the Brucella card test at the cell barn, whenever you got there and they had to pull a sample of blood out of the cow, put it on a card there, and if it reacted, you were immediately positive in what we called a banger, and you got you were quarantined. And that quarantine took an un, unknown amount of time until you could determine what strain. Uh, so obviously that's huge for agriculture folks. Uh, to, to worry about those quarantines if something like that would happen. Uh, locally, the Brucella situation now, we've made some huge strides and, and we can now identify really, really quickly the strain that could possibly be uh, of concern in our livestock. 
Uh, other things obviously out there with potential export stoppages like our African swine fever. Uh, African swine fever is not something that we really worry too much about as far as human uh, contamination or human infection, but the possibilities there of export stoppages, and we'll talk more about that uh, in detail as we move through. And anytime you talk about a disease, anything like that, that's obviously going to impact the economy at all levels, because the first thing that people think of whenever a disease uh, hits the newspaper or the media is that obviously it's something bad, it's something wrong, and anything that's affiliated with it is going to feel the, the repercussions of that, uh, that consideration or of that possibility of disease. So we need to think about, too, feral pigs. I mean, if you think about anything in your mind, just run through your mind, and definitely we don't want to put this in the chat or, or, or get it out there verbally, because I'm sure many of you could think of some pretty clear, uh, colorful ways to, to think of pigs, but one of the, the beneficial ways that we can think of a pig, though, is that they are a reservoir for a disease. So if we want to find out if diseases are on the landscape, the first thing that, that's going to come to my mind is just go check the pigs, because if the, if a disease is in the area, if there's any possibility of that disease in the area, a feral hog can carry it. It's going to be in there just because of the way they eat, they drink, uh, their behavior, uh, things of that nature. So they, if you want to think of a beneficial way of a, or a beneficial aspect of a pig, that's probably, in my mind, the only one. Uh, but they are definitely a, a disease reservoir that can it can identify diseases very, very quickly in a, in a relatively short period of time if they're in your area. Other things that pigs are is, uh, as far as the propagation of diseases and dispersal, uh, obviously pigs can be a direct host. They carry disease A, they can move it from, from that individual to the remaining individuals in the sounder, whether that's a, a detrimental effect on them or not, uh, or they can, they can move it to other places. Um, other ways is indirect or a dead end host meaning that if they're an indirect or a dead-end host, they can pick that disease up, they can move it around. So in the example of brucella, we'll talk a little bit more about brucella in a minute, but in brucella, back in the day, when we were talking about the card test at the livestock barns, the, 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 the brucella strain that we were worried about was brucella abortus. That's the strain of brucella that, 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 that affected cattle in the way that they would abort feces and so forth and so on. Well, in the situation with pigs, Brucella abortus doesn't affect the pig. It's going to be an indirect or a dead end host where they can take that Brucella abortus and potentially move that from a, a, a dirty cattle herd to a clean cattle herd or so forth and so on. So you've got direct and indirect uh, uh, host as far, and, and as well as a dead end host. Um, so we need to think about this disruption of the, the, the disease and uh, in the soils. And what we'll talk more about this in the soils is if we think about uh, more in the lines of possibilities. We really don't know about how well these pigs are going to influence the spread of diseases whenever we think about the diseases in the soil and predominantly that are spore borne. And when we talk about things that are spore to borne, and first thing that comes to mind is anthrax. We'll talk a little bit more as we move through this. But the second one is there is chronic wasting disease. We know that the prions of, of chronic wasting disease or the shedding of, of the chronic wasting disease can stay in the ground for very, very long periods of time where uh, CWD was first identified in Colorado back, I think, in 1967. They can still find evidence of that in the ground today. So if we have pigs get into that area, what are some of the possibilities of moving that around? We really don't know, but there is that consideration there that we need to, to keep in our mind. Uh, so whenever we're talking about some of the zoonotic um, diseases earlier on or are defined zoonotic. Uh, one of the things that Oklahoma did here recently is they come out with some uh, some information that they have identified up to 66 different diseases in wild pigs. That does not mean that every wild pig out there has 66 diseases. What that means is that they have been able to find that they carry up to. So you may go for vast expanses and there's absolutely no disease at all in any of the pigs. And then you come into some things, what we call a hot spot, and there may be uh, several diseases in a given area. Now, of those 66 different diseases that they've identified, about 23, 24 of those are zoonotics. So those are the ones that we worry more specifically about with regard to human transmission and infection. So that's something that, that really could, should raise an eyebrow in, in, in how we handle pigs in certain areas. But again, too, that's one of those things that to check with your local game and fish authority to find out where some of those potential hot spots would be, uh, where you need to think about uh, your different management strategies moving forward. And we'll speak specifically to that with regard to using hunting dogs moving forward with 
with uh, some of those diseases that potentially could be in the area. Uh, the vast majority of, of infected feral pigs show no external symptoms or signs or anything like that. That's the word, the fancy word is asymptomatic. It's only in clinical confirmations. So whenever we come up to a, a pig breed trap full of, of pigs, we may not be able to tell anybody is sick in that trap at all. And they very well could, could potentially be not sick. They may not have any diseases, but then they also too, because of asymptomatic situations, there could be some of those that are positive in that sound or in that trap. So with regard to pigs and, and diseases, uh, none of us out there have that silver, that, 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 that uh, crystal ball that can tell when you walk up to a trap, if a pig has a specific disease or not. We just need to, to treat everything with as safe as possible and however we can keep, treat those, those animals with regard to the safety of all. Uh, the other things that we need to think about there is that regarding the question that we ask at the beginning of this is that, does anyone uh, out there uh, consume wild pig? Do you put it on the barbecue pit? Do you fry it up? Do you put it in the oven or do you, do you put it in the crock pot? I mean, it's just a a myriad of different ways that people have have uh, used that that protein availability that we have in a trap. And uh, so basically what we need to do with a take home on this is this is something that a lot of people kind of kind of tilt their head on a little bit. But research has indicated that no human infection has occurred from consuming properly cooked wild pork that read that again from consuming properly cooked wild pork. So whenever we think about properly cooking pig, we don't want to think about sushi pig. Okay. So we want to think about pigs that we cook to an internal temperature, 160 degrees for about five minutes. We want to make sure they're cooked thoroughly and, uh, and anything that could potentially be in that meat tissue, that muscle tissue is, uh, has been killed by the, the process of cooking. The situation that we worry about is infection and transmission is, is at its highest potential during the handling and the processing. So, folks, that means whenever we're taking those pigs out of that trap after they've been rehabilitated, uh, they need you need to think about that. So uh, that's something to, to, that as you're as you're putting them on that that processing rack, making sure that you protect your hands and your eyes. And definitely that's not the time to be screaming at your kids. So you need to keep your mouth shut because of that, that possibility of fluid in the air and, and, and so forth and so on. So uh, make sure that whenever you're using that, that protein source as a food source, that you follow the, the, the handling suggestions that are there um, to, to basically mitigate against that possible contamination or that transmission effect. Because basically once it makes it to the skillet or to the barbecue pit and you cook it to that, that correct temperature and time, uh, we don't have to worry about any of that pork being unsafe for human consumption. So the next thing, moving on, population and disease potential. Is there a correlation between population and disease potential? Obviously there is, uh, but the disease potential and population density are directly correlated in most instances. What that means is as population densities decrease, so does the possibility of disease potential. So that's something that if you want a healthier sounder of pigs, you got to knock out the extras out of the pasture. So this is something to think about with, with regard to tons of other places with cattle, with white-tailed deer herds, things of that nature. When your population densities are low, then, then we have a lot more availability for nutritious foods, a lot better habitat. It doesn't support uh, the, the disease potential as, as uh more, I guess, in a, in a higher possibility uh, whenever they're compared to high densities. Uh, low densities equate to the increase in health of remaining feral hogs. So that's something that you think about. If you're knocking those populations down, the density decreases. As the density decreases, your environment obviously is going to get more productive. As that environment gets more productive, that just means more food. And whenever that's lower densities of pigs with higher and more nutritious of food availability, the higher the reproductive potential is going to be. So that sow that may have been really struggling to find some food may have had a litter size of three or four. But whenever you take a lot of those pigs off that environment, her litter size may jump up to seven, eight, nine pigs. So keep that in mind. So the harder the harder you manage those pigs or the more intensely you manage those pigs, we need to make sure that we remember that if we take our foot off the pedal on there with that increased food availability and nutrition, those numbers can rebound extremely, extremely quick. Uh, so 
What we'll do in the next few slides is we're going to move into some of the individual diseases that are out there uh, uh, that may be in print media or, 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 or on the screen somewhere. You may be reading it on the, the, the highlights on the news, on the computers in the morning, things of that nature. But I think it's going to be hard pressed to find anybody that's in the in anywhere in the pig world, very, whether it's domestic or, or wild, that hasn't heard of African swine fever. Uh, African swine fever there, as it says on the screen, is a highly contagious system. A systemic viral disease of swine and wild sewage characterized by fever, recumbency, uh, epidermal cyanosis, and uh, uh, visceral hemorrhages. So basically, there's a lot of things out there that, that, that indicate African swine fever, but the problem is, is that clinical signs is post-mortem. You really can't tell anything about African swine fever until you actually get up and start to look at that animal really, really closely. So it's super, super t difficult to go out there and know what you have in the area. It is obviously a global concern to domestic swine export and the economy. So whenever we think about that is that in the United States, we have not found African swine fever. We know that it's it's in quite a few countries over the Eastern continent or the European continent rather. And then also we know that we have it down in some of the Caribbean islands and whatnot. But as far as right now testing in the States, we do not have a positive case of African swine fever. It is definitely on the top of the list as far as uh, um, surveillance and, and sampling, testing pigs uh, out there to try to find or to, to be on aware uh, of when that possible first case could could arise because to kind of rest assured folks every state agency out there has a response plan in place for african swine fever if and when it does uh, uh show its ugly little head in the united states but uh situation and that's it is is obviously we're worried about the export and the economy uh with regard to african swine fever because obviously if there's no pig being imported into the united states States, it's going to increase in price, which, um, and uh, on the flip side of that is if you can't export pigs that you have in surplus, then your economy can, can see some pretty heavy hits as well. Um, African swine fever management is depopulation is the avenue to stop the spread or is an avenue to stop the spread. Uh, other things that you can do out there in addition to depopulation is double fencing and things of that nature there just to try to keep potential pigs uh, that could carry that ASF away from those domestic uh, herds. But something to keep in mind, it's not here in the States yet, but it is definitely all over the media. Uh, everywhere we see there's African swine fever information uh, plastered all, all around. The next thing is brucella. Brucella is something that is a zoonotic disease. Uh, brucella has seven strains that is a bacterial uh, situation there, and it can be spread through the air, through direct contact with in, infected animals. Uh, so obviously we need to think about uh, bodily fluids. We need to think about uh, whether or not that it's being sprayed in like an aerosol, should something uh, that that animal sneeze or snort, or if you've got animals in the in the pig brig, and if they you start walking up to that pig brig, you hear those those uh, pigs start to bark at you, snort at you, so forth and so on. We need to kind of think about that, keep that in mind as well. Signs and symptoms include fever, joint pain, and fatigue. So that's that could be any symptoms of uh, uh, any list, a long list of different uh, disease possibilities, but it's something to keep in mind. And I've known a few folks over the day, over the years that have had brucella that they've contracted from feral pigs and and sometimes whenever they go in just because of those symptoms there the doctors are not aware of what they should be testing for until they really start interrogating that individual pretty profusely to find out that they even had contact with a feral hog uh, they just can't figure out the source of what it is that where where their symptoms are coming from and whenever they identify the pig then they test for the brucella and there it is so uh, treatment is available, but treatment in this situation can take weeks to months and can reoccur. So uh, that's something that, uh, again, prevention is the is the cure. So uh, it's affecting hundreds and thousands of people uh, around the world annually, and it's something that we probably are, are not going to see go away. Uh, but it's something that we need to be aware of. Obviously, there with the fever, joint pain, and fatigue is something we'll see. Uh, uh, humans are susceptible to all seven strains of brucella. But the strain that we're most concerned with as humans is the one that affects the goats and the sheep, which is uh, Brucella melatonensis. Uh, Brucella abortus is what we see in our cattle, which in the pig, the feral hog, uh, the, the feral hog is a, is a dead-end host for Brucella abortus uh, concerning our cattle. 
So we're moving on to the next one, it's pseudorabies. And pseudorabies is, uh, PRV is a disease of swine that can affect everything but humans and hominids. So everything out there except us and the apes uh, are susceptible to PRV. And, and what we need to think about that in, in the PRV is when we start thinking about that, that third bullet down there is near 100% fatal to dogs. But PRV is a highly contag contagious herpes virus. It's called reproductive problems and abortion stillbirths and occasional death in swine. It says occasional. OK, so what we need to keep in mind there is that, yes, early on, those young pigs, those those fetal pigs or those those new births, they can be uh, aborted or born or born dead. But the concern there is it is a virus. So vaccine is the only option that's there. So when we think about that vaccine, though, it's limited in its efficacy as far as to protect your dogs. So when we think about hunting dogs with regard to PRV, uh, nearly fatal whenever they are, are infected with with PRV. So uh, the other thing there, it says there about uh, abortions and stillbirths, that is also a symptom of brucella suis. The swine version of brucella is that those those females just get to the point where they're almost barren. They can't they can't carry a litter. They have an early early stage abortions. Very still, very rarely do you see them have stillbirth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the very last slide of this, this presentation, where that really means anything to you whenever you start walking up to a trap. So uh, several modes of transmission, and it can remain in adult pigs for a long period of time. And that's the scary part, folks, is that it's if it's in that, that wild population and you've got an adult animal, yeah, they still may have some, some issues out there with abortions and stillbirths, but basically... Uh, PRV is not going to kill that adult animal, and then thus it's going to remain on the landscape for longer periods of time. And the longer they're out there, obviously they're going to be in interactions with more and more wildlife and more and more uh, of our livestock or our pets or anything like that. There is no treatment for the virus, and, and the only thing you can do is somewhat treat the symptoms and uh, just like any other virus that's out there. So the next thing is we're going to combine a, a couple areas. We'll talk a little bit about trick and tularemia. Uh, trick is a roundworm infection uh, that's commonly found in animals and human populations in underdeveloped parts of the world. So we'll tell you this, this is something that we definitely have to make sure that we're, we're aware of whenever we're thinking about our, our, uh, our wild pigs and, and, and so forth, is obviously we're worried about trick in our bulls and in our livestock stock herds and whatnot, but it's just something that we really, really need to make sure that we are stay aware of in our wild populations. So, and, and like the slide says, underdeveloped parts of the world that depend almost exclusively for wild pigs as their pork part of their diet. So uh, that's something to keep on your radar with regard to disease always is, is trick. The next one's going to be tularemia, which is uh, the slang term there, or just the common wording is rabbit fever. Uh, it's a bacterial category A bioterrorism agent. And folks, this is when we talk about a category A. A doesn't mean good like it did whenever we were in school. Uh, bacterial A category is the highest level of, of bioterrorism agent because of the potential for fatality. Uh, it's also for airborne dissemination and societal disruption if it's released. So anytime we hear the word disease or anything like that nowadays, it's, it's an immediate response and it's almost into uh, chaos relatively quickly. Uh, so that's something that we need to keep in mind. It is something that we have to worry about um, in our pig problem or in our pig populations as far as uh, can they carry it? Yes, they can. But how often do pigs carry it? We may only find one case of this a year in the state of Texas alone. So it may not ever even show up in your in your your wild pigs or your domestic pigs in the state that you're at, but it's one of those ones with it being a category A bioterrorism agent. We have to keep our, our finger on where it's at at all times. And treatment can be effective if it started early. So that's the, the big key there is that we need to we need to stay on guard about this. <clears throat> the next one that's coming up here is anthrax. And, and whenever we think about anthrax, this is another one of those words that if it's used in the media, that it, it gets an immediate response. And it's not one that's the warm, fuzzy feelings inside. Okay. So, uh, but the thing is, is that you think about how tough and resilient a pig is, whenever it comes to anthrax, it does not affect feral pigs. There's been some university studies that have indicated this, and they've, re uh, they've repeated those studies and, and it found out that those animals can, can, um, can cause problems with regard to anthrax and other places, but they are not 
uh, infected or they're not harmed by the anthrax directly. Uh, aerial movement through spores. So basically, uh, anthrax is in spores in the ground. And so transmission can occur through nose to soil con uh, contact and poorly managed landscapes where anthrax is endemic. So uh, where I'm at in the state of Texas, there's an endemic zone of anthrax, basically from Del Rio, Texas, up through San Angelo, um, all the way up to basically Wichita Falls. And, and every year we'll see maybe a case or two of anthrax that shows up. And a lot of those situations there, we look at the landscape and we see that those animals on the landscape that were affected by anthrax literally had to graze with their nose on the ground. And uh, that nose to soil contact is where it, where it came up. So uh, some of those locations there, the white-tailed deer population, have gotten to the point where they're so low that they're not of huntable numbers. Uh, the situation surrounding anthrax and pigs, if pigs are not affected by it and the spores are in the ground, where are the pig, where's the pig going to stick his nose? So now, even if we have good sound management on that landscape that leaves that vegetation stubble height at four or five inches above ground, that prevents nose to soil contact. But what happens in those well-managed areas that does have that stubble height, and then here comes the sounder of pigs through, and they turn that ground over and they 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 bust that that uh, stubble height up. Now we have now exposed bare, bare ground, and we're back at level one again uh, with what the potentials could be. So, uh, and again, I stress the fact of potential. All right. So we want to make sure that we're not here to to spread any kind of chaos or anything like that. We just want to make sure that you're aware of what the facts are. Uh, so now, after the catch. So with regard to after the catch, this is something that whenever we we get to that trap, we got that that pig brig doing its job working catching a pig. Now we've got to take care of doing our job and we got to get them out of the trap. We got to make sure that we we dispose of them properly or we're going to put them on a skinning rack and, and use them for barbecue material. What do we need to think about? So visually assess each pig for possible obvious disease concerns. Now we say that, but a couple of places down there, we're going to talk a little bit more about this too, is that lesions and lasting open wounds or abnormal, bo ab abnormal body condition. Now, what I mean by this is abnormal body condition. Whenever we said earlier on that these pigs, if they're infected by a disease, are very likely to be asymptomatic, meaning that they show no signs. So what we need to think about when we walk up to a pig brig is if you've got a sounder full of pigs in that trap, is any of those individuals just absolutely not fitting the norm of the other individuals in the trap? What I mean by that is if you walk up to the trap and you've got a pig in there, or you've got 15 pigs in your pig brig and 14 of them are in good body condition, and one of them just looks horribly bad. Okay, so that could be a tip. The other things is obviously if that one is horribly bad, is it a female that's suckling pigs? So that's something to kind of use your own common sense about when you're looking at those body conditions of those animals in the trap. Uh, other things that could come to mind is that whenever I see some, some sounders uh, in traps is I start looking for the opposite of that. It's easy to pick out the skinny pig and wonder about what's going on there. That's obviously got to be a diseased pig. Well, maybe not. But the other thing I really look at whenever I come to a trap is, are there any females, specifically females in that trap, that are of a higher body condition? They have more fat on them than the other pigs in the trap. Because when we start thinking about that is, what did we say earlier with regard to PRV and brucella? With regard to PRV and brucella, they're asymptomatic and the adults are not affected. Uh, so, but they do cause abortions in early term still or, or, or stillbirths. So whenever I come up to a trap, and this has happened on a few pigs that I've caught over the years, is to find a, a guilt in that trap. And that guilt is 150, 175 pounds. And it's obvious that she's never had a litter of pigs before. Well, if we have a guilt, which is a female pig that's never given birth, why is she such a big bodied animal that's got excellent condition and she's never given birth? Well, it could very well be that's the tipping point there that could give you some concern with with uh, is she is she harboring brucella or PRV? Only way to check that is a clinical test. You're not going to be able to, to tell that at the trap. But if it's me, she's the one I'm going to donate to the worms in the pit. OK, I'm not going to take my chances. If she's 175 pounds and she's fat and she's never had pigs before, there is something else that's there. So use use your judgment on what you see in those those catches to determine if you're going to use those for barbecue material or not.
Uh, so in that situation, you clean out a trap. You've got pigs in the in the in the side by side or on the tractor buggy uh, or tractor bucket rather. Or those of y'all that are really good at what you're doing and y'all actually have to take a truck and a trailer down there to haul those pigs out of there. Then uh, then that's something to, to to keep in mind. Which ones stay on the trailer to go to the skinning rack? Which ones move? But we need to make sure that we we avoid direct contact with body fluids uh, and blood. So the other thing to keep in mind here is maybe you got your 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 catch dog out there your hog dogs that you used to go catch pigs with and it's obvious yeah we need to minimize their their uh interactions with those blood and bodily fluids and things like that but what about the little guy that's at the house that rides around on the front seat of the truck with you when you check cattle whenever you get that little guy out there and he's sitting there watching you skinning a pig and there's parts of that animal that hit the ground what is that little guy going to do even if he doesn't eat them he's going to go over there and nose around on them and all and that is direct contact with bodily fluids so if you want to even protect your little your little companion there that you used to check cows with make dang sure that whenever you're processing those pigs that you know where that animal that 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 dog is at all times uh so and especially for the situation the PRV uh PRV is is near 100% fatal and it doesn't take long folks it moves really really quickly uh so personal protective equipment is recommended for anyone handling carcasses and what we mean by personal protective equipment obviously we're protecting our hands and our eyes okay predominantly if you got cuts on your hands anything like that we want to make sure that we we keep those gloves on tight and and maybe even double layer them uh obviously keeping your eyes covered at all times is a good thing and for sure, uh, we've gotten accustomed to wearing masks over the last few years. That's what we're talking about here. You got to keep your mouth shut. We don't want to add any extra recipe to, to what you're carrying around. So the next thing that you're going to do is once that processing is taken care of and you've got everything in the coolers iced down or it's headed to the barbecue pit, we want to clean your equipment, your vehicles after you discard the carcasses. Because, guys, I'm going to tell you what. For those of you all out there that got a pocket knife in your pocket right now, how many times have you take that pocket knife and clean something and turn around the next day and use it to, to cut a sandwich or to, to cut a steak or something like that? I know I'm guilty of it. So we need to make sure that we clean the, the, the equipment, make sure you clean those vehicles after discarding those carcasses. Because if you're in, a, in the agriculture world or you're going to be around anything else, then wherever your boots have been is where you're going to be tracking anything that, that, that could potentially hurt uh, the, the other livestock species that's that's under your care. So uh, that's something to definitely always keep in mind is after the catch, that's whenever you prevent that that possible contamination or that infection um, and, and making sure that you cook that meat properly. And uh, this is not one of those times that we want to try to impress somebody with eating undercooked pork. So anyway, guys, that's uh, the, the last of the, the content slides that we have tonight. Uh, again, this is the, the events that we've got coming up with the topics that we'll be discussing. So whenever we start thinking about moving forward into those different events, think about some of those 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 topics with what you want to hear us cover. So if you know you specifically want to hear something covered in a topic, send that to us through pigbrig, uh, uh, info at pigbrig.com or uh, give us a call. Let us know specifically what your thoughts are, what you want us to cover. But with that and at this point, what we do and the progression of these is We'll open the door back up and we'll get Marshall and, and Margaret, some of the, and the ladies to join us again. And uh, we'll start navigating through some of your questions. So if you if you got them, ask them. All right. So if y'all see any questions roll through, we'll be glad to address them. All right. Yeah, I've got one right here. It's kind of long. Besides the internal parasites, the external parasites have been the most challenging for me personally to deal with. Even with using repellents, chiggers and fleas particularly are challenging me personally. Looking for solutions and or mitigating steps I might take, i.e. possibly a carbon monoxide bag slash box to put them for a bit before I scan them. Sorry if this, is, this webinar isn't focused on external parasites, but this is what negatively impact, impacting me for, for more than me more than anything else yeah and, and external parasites is definitely something that we kind of keep in mind with with pigs uh, all year long and and one of the things that we see with regard to external parasites is that there's peaks and valleys with parasites uh, you'll see perfectly healthy pigs typically have parasites in late winter, uh, things of that nature. But one of the things that you that external parasites can do as far as a giveaway 
uh, to other disease concerns is basically in your general health is that as your immune system goes down and you can and you progress through your infection stage, you typically quit taking care of your body. Whenever they quit taking care of their body, they obviously they increase in the possibility of external parasites. But in your situation, where we're at with regard to external parasites, to keep in mind and is that if that tick is on that, that pig and he's sucking the blood out of that pig, and then as he drops to the ground, that tick is carrying the blood that then could be uh, infected with whatever that pig had. So is that tick now, if he's not full, is he going to go back and attach to your dog? Something of that nature. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. Uh, with regard to what to do about them, uh, many times whenever I trap pigs is is there's plenty of food where I live. There's never a shortage of food. So one of the things I do whenever I trap pigs is if they're a fat, happy, healthy animal and they start showing up with, with intermittent patches of mud on them, that tells me that they're obviously scratching. And if they're obviously scratching, then they're scratching because they got a, a parasite of some concern. What I'll do is in that situation is I won't even use bait in your typical situation to, to catch pigs, I will use um, uh, uh, oil. I'll use not, and I'm not talking about like burnt mortar oil, because I'll tell you folks on answering that question, do you eat wild pigs or not? Absolutely. I don't remember the last time that I bought pork. But what I'll do is if you've got old fry grease or old fish grease is there close to your trap, Put that on a rug and wrap it around a fence post or a tree or lay it on the ground or something of that nature. And those pigs will rub that oil, rub that grease on there because any type of a, a product like that is an insecticide per se. The one thing that you keep in mind is if you see the electrical poles, light poles that have mud on them, they're using that crystal off those poles as an external parasite release. So whenever we see that, that opportunity there to use that pole, the one thing we want to keep in mind is that if you go and use burnt motor oil that may come out of the truck or the tractor, we have found that that residue will then seep through the skin and into the muscle tissue. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're going to give those animals an opportunity to, to, to remove that, uh, that external parasite, then that's basically uh, options there is you give them a way to do that with oil rubs and things of that nature. Uh, as far as anything else that you can do with, with those, those pigs prior to or, or in that catch process, there's not a lot. I mean, it's just it's basically going to roll down to the health of that animal and, and what you have out there. But uh, it still warrants that, that consideration there with what, what other potentials do they pose whenever that tick falls off. Because as that body, that, that pig carcass starts to cool, as soon as that pig carcass starts to cool, those ticks and fleas and lice are going to drop off. And if they're not full, they're going to try to reattach to wherever the next host is. So use those, use those, um, those oil rubs, use those things that you may still be using bait. You may be still catching pigs using food. But if you're wanting to get rid of those parasites local to your trap, throw one of those rubs up there. Give those an opportunity to remove those parasites before they get to the trap. All right. Um... Anything else? Do you do you recommend disinfecting the pig brig netting if you are moving between sites to avoid spreading diseases? If so, what disinfectant would you recommend? No, we don't really typically worry too much about it because that's one of the things is that if, if we're in using that brig, it's I mean, obviously a possibility. But it's one that, that whenever uh, these diseases are by and large exposed to the atmosphere, they die. They don't live very long. There are some out there that can hang around a little bit longer. Uh, the other question is, 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 is what could potentially be in your area? Now, if some of those places that have uh, high probabilities of diseases that are zoonotic, then yeah, we need, to, we need to wash that off. But with regard to washing and caring for that trap, we don't suggest putting anything on that trap other than just water, either through a water hose or a pressure washer, because that UV coating on that trap possibly could be broken down by any of those, those contaminants that could be in that uh, disinfectant or anything like that that you're using. So we definitely don't suggest that you put bleach on it or anything like that because of the, the possibility of the UV coating being compromised. But definitely a good question. Um, I do know that, that, that it's something that is in your mind, but also the next thing is, is that how do we concern ourselves with minimizing that possible contamination? For me, another thing, Marshall, and it's something that you may want to weigh in too, is that whenever we dispatch those pigs in the trap, we're not using a, a caliber of gun that's going to be extremely large where 
we have to worry about bodily fluids and things like that that's getting soaked into that net. So we're obviously we're using to dispatch those those pigs as a just a 22 with a solid cap ammunition, and that way we can minimize that bloodlet inside that trap. There's not much we can do about the, the the saliva and things like that if they're biting on the skirts and the net itself. But uh, just thinking about that caliber of the gun to minimize that that blood is is uh, is something to keep in mind. Uh, Kurt, where are you? Wh uh, what state are you located in in regards to uh, disposal of dead pigs? All right, Aaron, this one would be for you. Where is a good place to dump off dead pigs in Texas? Well, if they're fat and happy, I'll take them in my yard. Uh, so, I mean, that's something that, that <laughs> again, but but that's uh, but that's a good question. The, the main thing you need to think about, though, is that we legally cannot discard those animals in a waterway. And whenever it considers, a, whenever they consider a waterway in the state of Texas, that's even a ditch line that may be down the side of the county road. Anywhere that flows water, anything that's there, um, uh, close that could end up getting into a creek or a pond, anything like that. Where I would not, on the, a livestock situation, do not discard those pigs upslope of a livestock water tank, a pond. Uh, you don't want to get the runoff and run of the, of the, of the rain to fill that pond up with whatever is coming out of that pig. Uh, what I do whenever I'm worried, whenever I'm discarding pigs is, is again for everybody look at what your state law allows you to do because I know where Marshall's at in Georgia there's some things that's a little bit different in Texas whenever we're discarding pigs it's going to depend on what work I'm doing if I'm doing research work for university we're required to bury those pigs and if you're burying those pigs the the top pig doesn't need to be any any closer to three feet of the surface of the ground if it gets any closer than three feet of the surface of the ground then you're going to have situations where coyotes can smell that pig because a lot of the ground that we have in Texas and the Southeast is is, uh, is sandy. So with that high pore sand, you're gonna have those canines being able to smell those, those pigs, they'll dig them up. So if you're gonna bury those pigs, make sure there's sufficient depth. The next thing I'll do if you're burying pigs is to put lime over the top of them and lime will help to, to kill that smell a little bit easier, a little bit quicker, uh, where there's less likely to dig them up. Now I know where Marshall's at, it depends on water table. You gotta watch where your water tables are and things of that nature. Uh, so uh, about eight foot above the water table. Yeah. They've got to be foot above the water table. The other things that I'll do in Texas is whenever I know I'm not upslope of a pond or a waterway, then I'll dispose of those pigs uh, just on the landscape. And and with the, the, the vultures that we have and the coyotes and the scavengers, uh, I've had 40 or so pigs disappear within two or three days. They literally come in and just completely wipe them out. Uh, for those animals that are larger, that are thicker hided, like your big boars, uh, is basically whenever I drop those pigs on the landscape, I'll take a carpet knife and open those pigs up from one end to the other, just one swipe, and it allows those scavengers not to have to go through that thick shield on the shoulder, and they can go and, and, and get after those pigs from the inside out. Another thing to think about with regard to wherever you're at, it doesn't matter what state, is that a lot of y'all are probably, if you haven't already started spring calving, y'all going to start spring calving pretty quick. Whenever I'm discarding carcasses of pigs, and I know that there's a calving window that's coming up quickly, I'll discard those pigs as far away from wherever the birthing grounds are going to be for those calves, because I'm sure that most of you have had calves being consumed by coyotes and vultures in the past. So what I do is I'll discard those those pig carcasses as far away from from where I know I'm going to be calving at to take the focus of those predators and scavengers off the cattle and give those mamas a chance to get to their feet and those babies a chance to do the same and give those scavengers something else to eat on that takes their attention off. But number one, stay out of the water. Number two is just going to depend on what you want to do in the time that you have. If you're going to be catching big groups of pigs, uh, it's not uncommon if I've got a half a dozen traps out, I may catch anywhere from 50 to 80 pigs a night. So that's in a situation that you're catching those large numbers. The only thing that I do at that point is put a pit in the ground and, and put them in a pit because if you're discarding 50 to 80 pigs a night, there's no way that the scavengers are going to keep up with them. But if you're looking at 15 pigs a night, I wouldn't worry about it. You can discard them on the top, on the surface of the ground, just open those bigger animals up let those scavengers get in there so marshall you got anything else yeah um richard on your question for the rebar anchors they need to be um it needs to be half inch rebar and it needs to be about 30 uh 30 inches long 
Um, Richard also asked, does hey, what was it? What was his question, Marshall? Let him let him know what the question where the, you're answering. If, if if I use rebar for anchors, how long do they need to be, and what about the ends? Okay. Um, he also asked, does RSV affect coyotes? Is it RSV or PRV? Is Respiratory R RSV is going to affect quite a bit of just about everything. Uh, PRV, uh, uh, pseudorabies, yes, pseudorabies is going to be the same way on coyotes. It's a, it's, it, it, it's going to affect all of your canines almost just instantaneous, and they very seldom, very seldom live. And typical death it's, is within forty eight hours. Uh, it's twenty four hours, and it they act yeah. like the whole body itches when they have it, like right. twitching and jerking. Well, and see, and that's what it is with PRV, uh, pseudo rabies. Also, the 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 true term, the clinical term of pseudo rabies, is a jusky disease. And for those of us that were raised catching pigs, uh, it's called mad itch or the wild itch. Because just like what Marshall's saying, is anything that has PRV, they do get that situation that they just can't stop scratching. But but typically, yeah, death is within 24 hours of a of a dog, but not not much of anything is going to live past 48 hours as far as any kind of canine dogs or coyotes and it's a 50 50 chance um if you take it to the vet whether or not um it's going to live or die with uh the treatment yeah because i mean it's a virus the treatment is next to nil on on the recovery uh or, or anything like that and and typically before you realize that it's a prv possibility then the animals are too far gone to do anything about it. And your vet is going to hate you when you walk in because that means he's got to sanitize everything. Yeah. Um, Annie asked, what's everyone using for disinfecting your equipment? Most uh, WCOs, including me, use DSV. And that's it. And that's something that, that whenever we talk about disinfecting equipment, that's exactly what we're talking about. But whenever we say equipment, don't put that on that trap uh, because we don't know what the, the situation would be with regard to our our um uh our uv coating on that net so just use your water get it pressure washed off as best you can but yeah any of those disinfectants to, to, to clean off your your knife blades or anything like that to, to make sure that they're they're good and tidy um, but look for something that's a food grade type disinfectant we want to make sure that anything that you hit it with is going to be strong that that it's going to make sure that we're we're as safe as possible moving forward next thing that y'all need to think about for those of y'all that trailer pigs is what else do you use that stock trailer for? So if you're going to be using that stock trailer for moving cattle and things like that, whenever it comes to disinfecting, that's something you're going to have to spend some time on to make sure that you get all the cracks and crevices disinfected there as well. Um, Walter asked, hello, very nice presentation. I wanted to know how do you handle animal carcasses in relation to disease control? Well, whenever I'm handling the carcass is always, you're going to still have your PPE on, their personal protective equipment. Whenever I'm thinking that there is any kind of possibility of disease in the area, then I'm going to have my gloves on. The thing to remember with wearing gloves, don't use cotton or leather. Whenever we think of cotton and leather, we're thinking about it's, in, it's going to seep through the material and get into your hands, get on anywhere else there. So we want to make sure that you're wearing rubber or latex gloves whenever you think there's any possibility of disease that's out there. Other things that you can use, I mean, obviously, that you're going to have your, your eye protection, safety goggles on, things of that nature, uh, uh, face mask and, and so forth. But whenever I'm getting out there, the other thing that I'm going to do whenever I'm loading pigs up that I could think there may be a, a disease possibility, I'm not going to throw those animals on the trailer. Whenever they're dispatched and they're, they're laying in that trap and I've got to move them. Uh, again, whenever we start to throw those animals and you have bodies hitting things and so forth and so on, then obviously you're going to get some splatter that's there. So whenever you start moving diseased pigs, it needs to be done uh, efficiently as possible, but making sure that you do not hit those animals hard to, to, to lose any more bodily fluid. Now, another thing that I'll do is if I'm in that area is I try to work in pairs. Uh, one of the things is working in pairs, it's two sets of eyes on an animal that you may miss something with just you and somebody else can pick up. The other reason I work in pairs, if I'm thinking there's diseased animals in the area, is that 
I don't want to drag any of those animals. Whenever you're dragging those animals across the ground to get them to the tractor, to the truck or trailer, or whatever, you're going to be spreading whatever's in that animal all over that grass, all over that area that, that, that could end up being in contact with cattle or other livestock eating that grass later. So whenever I'm using two, two people, then I literally have somebody on the front leg, somebody on the back legs, and we carry every individual. We do not drag those pigs with regard to, to disease spreading. So um, it's a little bit more time consuming and so forth. But again, by, don't, don't let the possibility stop you from managing. Uh, we got to get out there and get those animals moved one way or another. So uh, excellent question. I mean, I, I definitely think that was that's something worth discussing is if we handle every animal like that they all could be infected, then we're not going to have to worry about anything with regard to infecting of, or not as much anyway, with regard of infecting livestock or, or pets. Um, let's see. Um, Kurt asked, can we dump them in the woods? He's uh, in Texas. Yes, definitely, Kurt. What we do, what, and, and, and where I'm at whenever I'm trapping pigs, is, is I'll try not to dump any animal within a half a mile of where I'm trapping. Now, I know that some other states, that they'll catch pigs, and literally those pigs are, are disposed of 50 yards from where that trap is. That doesn't affect them one way or another. I think it's just a personal preference. The the thing we have discarded them in the woods. I mean, we'll see. We've had we've had several times to have a camera on a carcass and see what happens over the progression of that. And it's going to be your same visitors in the woods uh, as you would have if they were out in the edge of the pasture or something like that. Except the vultures have a little bit more of a trouble getting down into the woods themselves to get to those those carcasses. But where you trade off the deal with losing your vultures, you're also going to pick up your possums and your coons and some of your other animals that may come in there to try to get a pork dinner also. Uh, so it's just going to be a different different community of animals that's coming in there uh, to feed on those animals, those, those pigs. The other things that we'll see sometimes it's increased in the woods and in those shady areas is you'll get more flies on those pigs, which means if there's more flies, there's more maggots, they just, they, they break down quicker. Uh, the other thing that's there typically in the woods is that there's more moisture on the ground and that moisture also aids in the decomposition of those pigs. So that's, uh, that's an excellent question, but yeah, I mean, I just, personally, I'm not gonna worry, I'm not gonna dispose of those carcasses anywhere in close proximity of that trap, but, uh yeah discarding them in the in the in the in the trees in the timber is definitely not a bad thing anything else marshall no, that's good it, questions folks oh yeah it's, uh, it's really good questions tonight uh annie says that she sometimes hauls pigs to a renderer um when she can't uh when she has disposal problems right so and that again too that's going to be just depending on what your state allows i mean and in, in some some states will require places like that to have special permitting uh that just gives a basically a flag there to have inspection entities come around and make sure that its sanitation is being handled the way that it's supposed to and so forth and so on so uh, but yeah, whatever your, your state allows, you need to be a, mindful of what your options are. The one yeah. thing that definitely always keep in mind is it is never, ever, ever legal, regardless of where you're at, to transport those pigs across state lines. Okay. Now, and I'm talking about a lot. Okay. If you're going to be taking them somewhere to, to get rid of them, not alive. They cannot cross the state line alive. Some states will allow some movement within the state uh, to certain locations, but never across state lines. Now, if you're deer hunting and you're in, in, in Louisiana and you live in Texas, then yeah, if that animal's in, in, the, in the cooler on ice and so forth and so on, then yeah, you can move them across state lines. But, um, but, but make sure that you're aware of what your availabilities are. Anything else? Yeah, we got, we got something in the, um, let's see, in the chat I wanna call, attention to okay we had um gotta find it now sorry about that bill long he said a friend of mine got brucellosis 
brucellosis, if I'm saying that right, from cleaning a sow that was pregnant. Some of the milk spilled out on his arm after his arms started swelling up and the doctors didn't know what it was for, for almost a month. And then right. um, he's still taking medication for it four years later. Not. Four years. Yeah. So, and that's something too, Margaret, just to add to that is, is earlier on several years ago, I had, and this is probably 15 years ago, I had a friend of mine that, that had a, a situation where some of those, and it was Brucella as well, that had those symptoms that we discussed uh, that just wouldn't go away. And they went and tested for the flu. They tested for all your typical situations that could have come up and everything was negative. And, and on like the sixth or seventh visit or something like that, he was just continuously declining in, uh, in health. And just so happened when the doctor was in the room to do some testing on him, he was talking to his wife and had made the comment about the cut on his hand and hadn't gotten any better since they were hog hunting. And the doctor said, what are you talking about hog hunting and a cut on your hand? And he told the doctor and he immediately pulled a test and it come back, back positive for brucella. So that's what I mean. Whenever you go to the doctors, make sure that your doctors uh, know what the situations are. They're, they're probably going to turn over every rock they can. But if we have doctors that are in urban environments that may not have a clue about pigs, you've got to divulge that information. Because, I mean, that's if you, you go to your farm on the weekend and something happens, but you go back home in the city and it starts showing symptoms, you're going to get doctors that may not know to ask those questions. But, yeah, that's... A, that, that typically is what happens, exactly what you just said there, Margaret, what that statement was, is we don't know what it is until we just run the full gamut. And then the longer it takes to get proper treatment, the longer the cure is going to take. And it may not happen. It may keep recurring the rest of your life. Um, I know that earlier, I think it was Mark, asked about um, chiggers and fleas from pigs, but, and then also kind of going along with that scenario, Norell said, ensure the clothes on your arms and legs are sealed with uh, like socks over the top of your pants or tie material around it to reduce any potential access to your skin. Um, I know that would be a helpful thing, but any other suggestions? Well, the other thing too, is if you've got these situations or concerns with ticks or chiggers or anything like that, is Whenever you're whenever you're in the woods trapping or anything like that, take your deep woods off can with you. Uh, saturate down. It's, I mean, if you were just going to take a walk through the woods, we can get ticks and chiggers in the spring of the year, uh, no matter what you're doing. So in order to, to minimize the possibility of, of those little creepy crawlies on you is just grab that deep woods off can and, and lather up pretty good before you start messing with your pigs and they they, uh, they tend to find another place to go. Yeah, Anybody no, else? The big thing with ticks now is the alpha gal that makes you allergic to animal protein. Yeah, there, there's always something rearing its ugly little head, and that's what we'll try to stay up to date on what's going on. But uh, anything else uh, with regard one, to diseases tonight? Uh, we've got, uh, well, well, two more now. Um, we have a growing okay. black bear population in Arkansas. Can most of these diseases and viruses be transmitted to bears as well? I don't think there's going to be anything that's not going to be on the list or that can be transmitted. It's going to be the mode of, of what they interact and how they interact. And I think the concern there with bears and pigs both being omnivores is their feeding habits and the possibilities of transmission. And this is something that just that, that thinking at a trap site, if you got pigs that are using a trap site and they leave, a spillage of corn that they may have run through their mouth or that they may have uh, uh, ex uh, defecated or whatever that those bears come along and now we've got a situation there. But yes, a lot of these diseases and things like that can affect your bear populations as well. Uh, Annie says, we use long lasting permethrin spray on clothing and boots for all wildlife. Yes. And, and that's what that's the number one thing, especially especially in the spring of the year. But whenever I hit the hit the grass, get off the pavement, that's the first thing I'm reaching for is is the about the highest strength permethrin that I can get or DEET or anything of that nature uh, that's going to keep those bugs back. Uh, but but that's that's about the only thing you can do to be, uh, I guess, effective for continual use. I mean, it's. In, in July and August, I'm going to tell you quite frankly, folks, in July and August, September, early September, whenever I'm catching pigs, it's a hard sell for me to get to put long sleeve shirts on and close my body up 
real tight to be able to get to those pigs. So uh, I know I may be the only one out there that does that, but I'll, I've still got my gloves on, still got my glasses on. But on those bare places of my body, I can promise you I've got the permethrin of the deep on in, in, in extremely good quantity. Anybody I else? I think we're good. We appreciate good. you guys coming tonight and answer um, asking good questions and um, good discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that y'all just please continue to, to, to pass the word around with these webinars. And, and uh, let's see, we'll come up to the next one there. We got next month. Dang, folks, it's already March. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about next month, though, is about what pigs do and how their functions change, their biology changes with regard to movements and so forth and so on, whenever it greens up in the spring. So it greens up in the spring, pig trappers typically start beating their head on the wall, trying to figure out what they need to do to catch pigs. So we're going to be talking about spring green up and what that's going to mean for you as a land manager uh, next month. But again, too, if you you think of something that you didn't that later after tonight that you want to ask, either ask us between now and next month, or get in next month and, and chime in early on and say, hey, I got a question from last month and we'll we'll hit that answer before we ever even get started. But excellent response, folks. Good, good questions and answers and so forth and so on. And I like definitely the fact the fact that y'all are passing around your experiences here as well. That's what we want to hear is uh, what's worked for you, what you do, things of that nature. Uh, just just sound management. That's what we need to do. We need to be, be more mindful of it. So we appreciate you. Is that it, folks? Thank you, guys. Y'all have a good night. Thank you, all. Thanks, all. all right, have a good, good evening. Be safe.